Okay, this is the start of Unit 4. Um, this is going to be Chapter 6 and 7 from the book. Really what we're going to be doing is we're going to still look at forces, but we're going to look at them from a rotational standpoint. The idea is that there's forces still going on even when things are kind of rotating or um, something like that. Um, examples that we'll be using are cars going around tracks, um, balls attached to strings that are being slung around, uh, roller coasters, uh, satellites, uh, planets around the sun, and um, uh, things like that all in chapter 6. Chapter 7 will get into a broader sense of um, rotational kinematics, like motion, um, and you know things like uh, what is uh, what's torque and um, uh, rotational inertia, all these things will come in chapter 7. So chapter um, uh, 6 is very similar to chapter 5 in that we're dealing exclusively with forces except for now we're just saying okay in the rotational frame so it's a little bit different uh, to add one more note here uh, after reviewing this video I found that there's a distracting noise in the background uh, it's not me eating on a bag of chips the entire time um, the table that I'm working on is very kind of creaky and every time I lean on it it kind of makes some creaks like that right and that is what it sounds like it sounds like a bag of chips but it, sorry about that first of all we're going to go back to our um, our previous chapters I believe it was chapter 3 we're talking about two-dimensional motion we had at the chapter at the end of that that was called um, a little section at the end that was called a centripetal acceleration now we called that uniform circular motion and what the uniform means is constant speed, okay, in a circular path. All right, so uniform is constant speed. Circular path means circular, so we're talking about a uniform circular motion. Of course, that also implies a constant radius. So this thing isn't this thing isn't spiraling, you know, in like this, like that. That would be the radius would be changing at that point. So we're not talking about that. All right, we're talking about uniform circular motion, a constant speed at a constant radius, you know, going in a, you know, complete circle. So what we're going to do is we are going to, um, we need a couple of equations to, to remind us. One is um, just general circumference. Uh, so this equation for that is 2 pi r also equal to pi d. So either one of those is acceptable. Okay, and the other one is we had our formula for centripetal acceleration before, and that was v squared over r. Okay, so we're going to be using these uh, upcoming. So these, these are just reminders here um, about that. Uh, so let's look at an example. If the radius is 100 meters and your speed is 20 meters per second, how long does it take you to complete one lap? So keep in mind that your, uh, your velocity here is constantly changing, right? So as you go around the circle, your velocity is, you know, this way, you're, you know, this way, all that kind of stuff like that, right? But it's, velocity is constantly changing, but the speed, uh, the speed does not, because that's just a magnitude. Okay, so now we're going to look at this. Um, so what is, how long does it take, hmm, so I'm talking about time, and I have a constant speed, uh, so speed, S for speed, so okay, speed is distance over time, all right, when we're talking about average speed, that's what we use, um, you know, displacement would be delta X over T, but the idea is that, you know, remember if you go around the lap a hundred times, you have no displacement, but you have a whole bunch of distance, so we're going to use distance divided by time, so, um, okay, so we're talking about one lap, so what's my distance for for one lap around the track? All right, so that's the same as the I'm going to use capital C for circumference divided by time. Okay, circumference is two pi r. So I'll write this. Um, so here, I'll take that c and make it two pi r, and that's divided by the time. So let's plug in some of the values here. We have um, speed is 20, all right? So we're going to say, okay, speed is 20, and 20 meters per second. 
and we have 2 pi and r, oh sorry, r radius is given to me as 100. And that's all divided by t. And we're going to have to solve for t right here. So let's get the calculator out and see what this is. Okay, I can see that, uh, see if I rearrange this, this is t, uh, and then 2 times 100 is 200 pi, and then that's going to be divided by 20, uh, 20 meters per second, or 20, let's say that, and then this, da 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 da, da. so this is a 10, that's a 10 pi seconds. Well, that, that seems very very strange uh, having a pi, you know, seconds, but uh, so if I calculate that out or multiply it out, then, you know, 3.14 times 10 is 31.4 seconds. I actually didn't need the calculator for that one. Okay, so it takes me 34, 31.4 seconds to go around a 100 meter uh, track at 20 meters per second, about, you know, 45 miles an hour. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this a special name. We're going to call this, instead of using lowercase t, we'll, take, we'll call it uh, capital T, which is going to be short for period. Alright, and what we're going to do is say we're, a period is the time it takes to complete one revolution, or one cycle, one lap. Um, revolution is going to be our generic term for that, because we'll have things that are not like, you know, cars on racetracks, but also... Um, things that are uh, more like, um, you know, let's say, uh, like old records or CDs or DVDs or, you know, Blu-rays, whatever it is that spin. Uh, we use capital T, right, for this. Now, again, we do use capital T for tension. This is something that we can do. We can, we can tell the difference between when we're talking about capital T for tension and capital T for period. It's all in the problem, it's all in the context. We, we're, we can handle this, right? Uh, our generic units are seconds, okay? So, uh, so in the previous problem we said that we can do 31, that was, or we said basically we, it takes 31.4 seconds to do one lap. All right, that's the other other no, another way to say that is one a period is thirty one point four seconds. So if the radius is one hundred meters and your speed is two twenty meters per second, how many laps do you complete in a second? All right, so if we actually go back um, and we say, okay, what well, circumference was two pi r, which is two pi times one hundred meters. Uh, so that's 200 pi, I'll, I'll calculate that out just to see what that number is. So 200 pi is 628, uh, let's say 0.3, just keep that one of those round meters. That's how, that's how long the distance is. Now, if I'm only covering 20 meters per second, each second I only cover 20 meters, how many laps do I complete per second? How many revolutions? How many cycles? Well, it's going to be less than one, right? And way less than, right? So I, you know, I can think about what fraction of a lap do I do? If it takes 31 seconds, all right, to complete 31.4 seconds to complete one lap, how many do I do in just one second? Well, um, it's really what I'm talking about is a fraction of that. So. Uh, what I need to do is write this out as a fraction. So uh, I'm doing one second out of 31.4. 31 what this is is um, not revolutions per second, but seconds per revolutions. Right? So this is seconds per cycles, per revolutions, anything else like that. And essentially, just revolution is just a placeholder. It, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. It just means, yeah, just reminding you that it's a cycle. So what fraction of that, you know, do I do? And so I can find that. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, 1 divided by 31.4. And I get the idea that I do, um, you know, 0 0.031, and I'll just say 5 cycles. Actually, I'm not going to use cycles. I'm going to use... Uh, revolutions 
every second. Okay? And what we call this, right, because this is a very small number, but if I multiply it by 31.4, I will get my, you know, the, the full amount, and, you know, the time it takes to do one, one, one period. Um, and so what we call this is um, the frequency. Okay? So the frequency. It's another kind of lowercase script f, and again, you know, we're big boys and girls. We can look at this and know that this is not friction that we're talking about, but this is a frequency, and we can deal with this, okay? Same script, just like capital T, we use for tension, lowercase f, we use for friction. We're okay, all right? You know, this doesn't have any subscript of s or k, so we also know that also. So what we're going to call that is the number of revolutions per unit, uh, per unit time, sorry, is called frequency. Okay, the number of revolutions per unit time, and our unit time is a, a second. Okay, so how you know basically what fraction of a you know of a um, revolution do we do uh, in one second? That's going to be uh, frequency, as I stated before. Uh, our units, uh, we're talking about revolutions per second. So our you know RP, uh, sorry, not RPMs, um, but revs per second. Uh, this is also known as HZ, which is short for Hertz. Okay, so this is Hertz, named after the man Hertz. All right, how are these two related, frequency and period? Uh, they are inverses of each other. So frequency is 1 over period, and period is equal to 1 over frequency. All right, uh, you can think of it this way. Um, you know, magazine subscriptions come once a month, um, and then you can say, okay, well, that means once one twelfth of every year, right? Is it is, um, is the amount of time it takes to get a new magazine, right? But how many times do you receive a magazine a year? And you say that's one twelfth is you know inverse that, and that is twelve. So twelve is the frequent. Uh, sorry, uh, twelve is the frequency. One twelfth of a year is the is the period, right? So, um, how much time does it, you know, take to do that? One twelfth. Okay. So those two are kind of related uh, in this way. All right. So you can swap back and forth very, very easy. Uh, and we think about this in, you know, the number of laps. Let's say it's a race and it takes you two minutes, uh, which is the same thing as 120 seconds, you know, to do uh, a lap. Uh, how many laps do you do per second? All right, so you do one one hundred and twentieth of a lap, you know, every second, All right? Because this is really, you know, it's really revolutions per second, and then what this ends up being is um, number of uh, um, sorry, this is not revolutions per second. This is um, seconds per revolution, and seconds per revolution. And if I do an inverse of that, all right. Then this is uh, seconds per rev, right? And then I do an inverse of that and end up with revolutions per second, okay? So this is really what we do with frequency. Now, there's something similar to this that is called RPM. RPM stands for revolutions, right, per minute, right? And just, it's just same concept, just used a little differently. We use this in cars. Your tachometer measures an RPM, which is the number of revolutions that your your drivetrain goes through uh, based off of your engine performance. All right. Now the other thing we remember from um, our previous lessons is the idea of centripetal acceleration. All right, that I can constantly go around this circle. As this is doing right here, I can go around the circle at a constant speed, constant radius. All right, we call that uniform circular motion. And the idea is that my velocity, the direction that I'm pointing at all times, is changing. If you notice, this velocity is always a tangent line, right, to to the circle. So we're going to call this like the velocity there. That's tangential velocity. And we'll get into that subtlety in a little bit later, but um, we will call it tangential or we'll call it linear. 
all right, something else like that. Either one of those two terms. Just keep that in mind. So remember that this is your yeah, v here, all right. That's essentially your uh, tangential speed, all right, uh, squared. Um, again, direction doesn't go into that. Um, and basically, when we do this, and we did that uh, whole kind of vector subtraction thing, uh, you know, final minus initial, and so on, and so on, and we ended up with you know acceleration inwards. Um, when we did that, we had this equation right here that was given to us, right? Okay, now we're going to take this equation and apply it in the sense of uh, what we learned before, which is like if I wanted a speed, oops, that's a wrong thing there. If I wanted a speed of an object, all right, that is also equal to the circumference, uh, going in circle, speed of an object's uh, circumference by period. So let's look at that in the next slide. Okay, so this is a derivation. Now, derivations. Let's talk about derivations. Derivations are important to understand, but they're not a, a something to memorize. Okay, now, in reality, I want you to understand this. Alright, and I want you to understand this. Now, I would like you to be able to put these two together, as I've mentioned here, and come up with other things by yourself. This is something that you can do. You you are fully capable. You have Algebra 1 skills. I will not re require you to memorize these kind of equations um, or, or anything else like that, um, but you have to be able to be able to look at this and kind of rearrange things in your own head and kind of create some meaning, not only for uh, your own understanding, but also for the AP exam. So an AP exam question could be to you know, express, um, express, you know, express period as I have here where I was just erasing uh, in terms of radius and centripetal acceleration and that's what you have to come up with. So let's let's look at this one by one and get erase some of this stuff and get going here. Alright, first of all, all right, as we said before that the uh, velocity is distance divided by time. We're talking about circular motion, alright? So your distance is your circumference. Time is your period. We use capital T now instead of lowercase t. Circumference is equal to 2 pi r. All right. Got this. We're good. Okay. Now, centripetal acceleration, as the equation that we had from Chapter 3, is this. So what happens if I take this velocity, right, right here, and I take this value and I substitute it in right here. So essentially this it says v squared right here. So whatever that v is, is this. And that's going to get squared. Right? This is going to get squared. So here it is being squared. And 1 over r is kind of taken out and put separate. So what do I see also? I see 2 pi r on top. Uh, that's squared though. So it's, it's really 4 pi r squared. 4 pi squared r squared uh, and then t squared on bottom but we're not going to do that but I will look and see that this is an r and that's going to be squared so r squared and I have 1 over r here so r squared divided by r uh, is basically just r and I can just take you know leave that out uh, right here alright and I'm left with 2 pi t uh, in the middle here Alright, so what I'm saying now is my centripetal acceleration is the same as this. Alright, so that's what I have uh, right here. Is that, uh, you know, 2 pi over t uh, is this. Now, if I take this and I solve for t, I get this over here. Again, this is something that you should be able to look at this and say, okay, I make a few substitutions and then go from there. Because I know what this is, and I know what this is, and I just do a little bit of substitutions. Another way to write it is this. All right, uh, we'll uh, we'll see this format quite a bit when we're talking about circular or repetitive type motions, and we'll come back to this as you see that. You do not have to memorize any of these equations, and in reality, when I do a problem and I do problem solving, I tend to think of it. Okay, well, let me find my, you know, speed average speed and let me find my then plug that into my centripetal acceleration that's the way you typically do it but again be prepared to 
you know, look at some things and solve for one thing in terms of another, whether it's period or frequency. So here's an example. Uh, an audio CD has a diameter of 120 millimeters and spins at 540 RPM. Remember, RPM is revolutions per minute. When a CD is spinning at its maximum rate, how much time is required for one revolution? How fast is a speck of dust traveling on the outside edge? And what is the dust acceleration? So three parts to this. Um, let's go ahead and get, in, get on to it, okay? So I have a diameter of 120 millimeters. So let's write this down. So my D is equal to 120 millimeters. All right, that's the same thing as 0 0.1 to zero meters. Uh, it also means my radius is one half of that. So I'll go ahead and say, okay, my radius is 0 0.060 meters. All right, because I need meters to do this. I have 540 RPMs. And that's revolutions per minute. Uh, this is a frequency. Oops, can't write that over there. Let's see if I can do this here. So this is a frequency. Uh, I want to change this to revolutions per second, so let's say times, and I'm going to use my dimensional analysis, and I'll say that um, one minute is equal to 60 seconds. Minutes, cancel, and now I get 540 divided by 60. That means I get nine revolutions per second. Penmanship's getting bad. Okay, nine revolutions per second. So the question is, uh, how much time is required for one revolution? So time per revolution, time per revolution. We have a special name for that. That's called period. So I need to know what is the period. Well, what do I know about period? It's one over the frequency. And if I know the frequency is nine revolutions per second, then I know basically the period is one divided by nine, which means it takes 0 0.111 seconds in order for it to do one cycle. And this is the opposite. Remember the, the example we had before, it takes longer, uh, sorry, um, it took, you know, multiple seconds for it to do a revolution. Now we're talking about it, you know, does a revolution in less than one second. So a little bit different. So that's our first, our part A is done right there. Part B says, how fast is a speck of dust traveling on the outside edge? Okay, so you got to think about this way. Um, the second equation that we had, or one that we had at the top of the last page, was that my speed, I'm looking for a speed, right? That was equal to, well, I had said my, cir for circular travel, circumference divided by period, uh, which was the same as 2 pi r uh, divided by period. Uh, let see, 2 pi, I keep that the same. And my radius was 0 0.06 meters. And I guess I could have just used diameter before and just had pi times d. And my period I found to be 0 0.11, just for exactness here, 0 0.111 seconds. So let's find out what this is. So 2 and pi times 0 0.06, right? That is all divided by 0.11. One, one seconds. And I get round about uh, 3.39 meter, uh, meters per second. So 3.39 3 or so meters per second. And that is the speed of a speck of dust at the end. Okay? So I found out the period and I used that to understand. Uh, what the speed is, because this is, you know, the distance traveled divided by time. Again, this is at a uh, constant rate, 
uh, it's not changing its rate so we can so we can use that all right eventually we'll get into things that change things and, and accelerate uh, okay next one what is the dust acceleration and what we have another equation for that uh, remember it's change it's going the same speed but it's changing direction so it has what we call a centripetal acceleration which is the speed squared divided by the radius alright so let's plug in our values 3.39 meters per second we're going to square that number and that's divided by the radius which is 0 0.06 meters so 3.39 divided, oh sorry, squared and that's going to be divided by 0 0.06 And I get 191.5 meters per second squared. All right, so these are my answers right here. Give them a nice little box so everybody knows what I have done. Okay, uh, this example I have a carnival ride that passengers will travel in a horizontal five meter radius circle. Actually, I can draw a circle here just to make it nice and easy. And, uh, okay, so let's say this is a 5 meter radius. Okay, and we've got passengers out here that are traveling, you know, in this kind of uh, tangential direction here. The maximum sustained acceleration that the riders may experience okay this is uh... actually we have to assume here that it's constant speed and this is correct um, and um, but it's just changing direction so we're talking about a centripetal acceleration so my centripetal acceleration most can be twenty meters per second squared about two g's again with one g being about ten or nine point eight was the period of the ride at max acceleration how fast are the riders moving? So um, I could go back a few slides and look at my um, centripetal acceleration. I think it was. Hold on, let me think about that. That's just, ex centripetal acceleration was equal to two pi. Oh gosh, that's a pi. Um, two pi over. Hmm, what was this? Because I substituted that and then the r. Well, I just remember it was times r here. Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember what that is actually now. But let's just let's just ignore that right now and say I can do I can figure this out on my own. I can figure this out on my own. Uh, what's the period of the ride? So I'm looking for capital T. And um, let's see. So I know that. Uh, let's see. What do I use with capital T? I know that v equals two pi. R times divided by T. Uh, so I also need to know the speed if I want to know periods. I do know the radius. So let's find the speed first, which actually happens to be the second part. So let's answer part B first. All right, it works out well for us because I don't want to memorize any equations. Uh, so part B, how fast are the riders moving? Um, okay, so I need a speed, and that is equal to distance divided by time. Um, and so okay so that's going to be my distance is 2 pi r which is the path around the circle uh, and then t is, is this right here um, hmm but I can't find anything there so let's, let's back up a little bit and say okay well if I need speed the other one is uh, centripetal acceleration is equal to speed squared divided by radius oh I know centripetal acceleration and I know my radius so I'm going to plug those in 20 meters per second squared is equal to speed squared divided by my radius which is 5. Alright, so what do I get? I get 5 times 20, this is 100. That's meters squared per second squared and so that means my speed is 10 meters per second. Alright, so that's my speed. Part B, done. Now I'm going to take that and go and plug it in here to find part A. 
Uh, okay, part A is this. So my speed is 10 meters per second. Uh, I get 2 pi times the radius of 5 meters uh, divided by the period. So now I'm going to have to rearrange this, and this ends up being uh, 10 pi. If I, if I multiply this right here, this is 10 pi. And then this gets over here. This gets divided over here. And so actually, I, well, this is a strange one. I end up with a period of, and this, sorry, I'll show this step. It's 10 pi divided by 10. All right, let's cancel. So my period actually is pi seconds. So period is 3.14 seconds. Sometimes it's easier just to leave with pies and not just deal with stuff like that. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it does not. All right, so I found what's the period of the ride, and I found what was its speed. Next, we have to tie in Newton's second law. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, let's look at this. Accelerations come from net forces, one of our key concepts from chapter uh, 4 and 5. So if I have a centripetal acceleration, all right, that comes from a net force. So there must be a net inward force to match this acceleration, to cause this acceleration. There must be a net inward force. All right. So let's look at this both mathematically and conceptually. First we look at it mathematically. All right. So Newton's second law says F equals MA. This is the net, right, the net force. Um, and so that is, there must be a net force inward, uh, that's called the centripetal acceleration. So if I take this, plug it in for my acceleration, I get a centripetal acceleration is equal to, uh, sorry, centripetal force, right, which is this right here, centripetal force, is equal to my mass times my centripetal acceleration. How much force is required to be inward in order to accelerate it inward at this rate? And again, accelerating inward doesn't mean that it's spiraling into the middle. It just means it's just changing direction uh, constantly at the same speed. And so what we're going to do is we're going to modify that last thing and say instead of the marquee banner being, you know, accelerations come from net forces, right? Centripetal accelerations come from centripetal forces. And, and I really want to, let's call this out right here, centripetal force. This is not... So not a named force. This is not, you know, uh, named in the fact that it's not friction. I mean, it's not like friction or it's not named in the stuff that we did. Like we did tension, we did weight, we did whatever. We did all these other forces and we call them names, whatever. What I'm saying is that there's going to be some kind of leftover net force, all right, that's going to cause this acceleration inward. All right, it's not, it, it can't, it could be normal force, it could be friction, it could be combination, whatever, but either way, there has to be a leftover net force, right, a net force that causes the centripetal acceleration. So centripetal force is not a new or unique force, but it is um, basically a net force in that direction. So our unified equation between those two is... Centripetal force is equal to mass times speed squared divided by the radius. And again, this right here, this is just centripetal acceleration. So mass times centripetal acceleration. And this is what we're going to apply to figure out the centripetal force. Centripetal force. Now, you may have some confusion here, all right? Did I say centripetal or did I say centrifugal? All right. So did you say centripetal? I thought it's supposed to be pronounced centrifugal, centrifugal. If I really pronounce it differently, centripetal or centrifugal. Well, I say, look at the Latin. Centripetal or pedal means center seeking. Centrifugal means center fleeing. If you ever heard the term tempus fugate, tempus fugate 
means that time flies, time leaves, time goes, right? Disappears, whatever. Fugal, fugate, right, means fleeing. So which one described the motion that we talked about? Because we had to agree on centripetal acceleration. And so we have to also agree on centripetal center seeking forces. But this is different. This is different from what we experience in reality. Another thing that's kind of tough. Like, you go through a turn. I don't feel like I'm being sucked into a turn. Actually, I feel the opposite, like I'm being pushed outward. All right? You can get mad at me. You can tell me that I'm lying. You can tell that, you know, I hate physics. I hate this. Ah, okay, fine. Just calm down. You are sensing something, but you are not sensing what you think you are. That's all. That's all. This happens. What you're doing is you're confusing your own inertia with an outward force, right? In the same way that we confuse our weight with the amount of, um, you know, what we feel on our feet. We don't feel our weight on our feet. We feel the ground pushing on us. You're, you're going to have the same thing uh, when we talk about centripetal forces. You feel what's pushing you to keep you going in a circle. You don't feel... Like you're being pushed outward. Okay, here's an example. All right, so we have a car, right, that is uh, rounding a curve. I'm sorry, not a car, but a truck. So here's my truck. Let's, you know, this is if I had a still truck parked here. I had the cab up here, you know, the hood up here, and this is my open thing in the past, in the back. Uh, let's say I had a box or make it even uh, easier a ball uh, in the back of the truck here uh, it's a slick you know slick back right here um, in the back of the truck you got a nice rhino liner or something else like that and um, so as you make this tight turn like this all right if we witness the ball's action from above actually let's let's talk about the ball's action as you see if you were turning and you looked back in your rear view mirror to see this um, either this box or this ball what you do is you'd see it move across like this, right? And to you, that's telling you that there's some kind of push outward, right? There's kind of an outward push that moves it from this end to this end. But in reality, let's look at this bottom diagram, what actually happens. Inertia says an object wants to stay in mo its state of motion. It wants to stay going in a straight line. And guess what? This is the weird part. That ball goes in a straight line. What happens is the car turns underneath that ball. All right, the car turns, the ball or the box or something, and we're talking about very low friction back here, the, will stay going in that same motion. So what do you see? You see it go from the left side, eventually to the middle, and eventually to the right side, in the same way that you saw it here. All right, if you're, you're driving and you just look backwards. And so what happens, and now it hits the wall over here, and then it's stuck to that wall. All right? It's not because, it's not because um, it's being pushed outward. It's because that wall is keeping it in that circle now. This was not part of the circle. All right? This is not a circle right here, but this is a circular path. All right? So what happens is that this, this normal force of the wall here, of the back of your truck, all right? the door, the wall, whatever you want to call it, is actually pushing inward in order to keep you keep the ball or the cart or I mean the whatever the object is going into a circle. All right, so this is a strange but true fact. And so we summarize this and say that a particle that moves in a constant speed, right, constant speed, uh, must have a net force pointing inwards. Right? It must have a net force. Now we call that net force centripetal force. Now remember, centripetal force is not a new force. It doesn't go in categories of normal friction, um, thrust, or anything else like that. It's just whatever left over, whatever net force there is that happens to be pointing inward to a circle, we just call it a centripetal force. Or if we see something going at a constant speed in a circle, we say it must have a centripetal force. And what that really means is it must have a net force to the middle. So example here, ball twirling on a string, right? Again, 
completely circular at a constant speed, right, there must be an inward force. And so what's providing that inward force? Well, this is the easiest example that we can think of. We know that this string right here is pulling on that ball. There's tension in the string, which means it pulls, and it pulls the opposite way. All right, so that tension keeps that ball going in a circle. If you cut that string, that ball does not go in a circle. A satellite that orbits the Earth. All right, here's the Earth down here, and you have a satellite. That satellite goes around and around the Earth. All right, if I make a nice circle, all right, Basically, it has to travel, right? So what's keeping it going, going in that circle? There has to be a, a force inward, a net force inward at all times. And that is your centripetal force, where the net force is really nothing but the force of gravity, otherwise known as weight. So all of these things can come become apparent uh, once you kind of accept that the idea that there is a inward pointing net force from all these objects. So here's an example uh, using the um, string and the ball. Uh, basically at all times, as we said, that there's a, you know, velocity, tangential velocity going at, you know, tangential to the circle at all times, right? Uh, in order for this to continuously change that direction, Right, the acceleration must be inward, right? And so, uh, the acceleration is inward, which means there must be an inward force provided by, you know, provided by the uh, string here. Right, that string provides an inward force. And let's just say, if you cut that string, you cut that string just as it is here. It's, the string breaks. Right, it was providing a force inward here, inward here, inward here. The same amount. Right, and then it breaks. So what happens? It no longer is changing that direction. Newton's first law takes over. It says things that want things in motion want to keep that same state of motion. So right here, it was going at this speed, as speed going in that direction. Guess what? It's going to continue going in that direction. There's no more inward force. There's no more things acting on it. There's no more net force to keep it going in a circle. And remember that impetus theory, right? Uh, some people will often say that, no, 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 it will keep on kind of going in a circle, but just not as good. It will kind of go like this, right? Because the force that you had on it, right, the force that you had on it stays with it, and then it slowly diminishes. All right, this is that impetus theory thinking, you know, that, you know, that isn't correct. Not to Newtonian or not to Newton way of thinking. Newton way of thinking says no 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 that's not right, All right? Uh, what needs to happen, right? What needs to happen is that there needs to be a, um, a directly, you know, it continues in that straight line. All right, so let's practice this uh, using a somewhat simple problem. Uh, I got a 0.1 kilogram ball attached to a 1.2 meter string, and it's swung around in a circle. Uh, we're talking about on the space station, and the only reason we do that is just to get rid of the sagging effect of gravity, which we'll talk about later. Uh, so gravity's not there, and it's uh, once every 1.5 seconds. All right, so it completes the cycle at once every 1.5 seconds. What is the tension in the string? Okay, so let's do a free body. Let's just do a picture here. Uh, I'll make a nice circle like this. Um, just to, oops, let's undo that. And, oh, can't quite get this. All right, there's my. All right, so a little circle here. And I got a um, you know, ball that's traveling on the outside like this and moving around, you know, like so. Okay, um, so it is attached to 1.2 meter string, so that means that this is 1.2 meters. Um, and it goes around one cycle, one complete cycle, every uh, 1.5 seconds. So we call that a period, 1.5 seconds. What is the tension in the string? So if I did a free body diagram, and we're going to ignore any gravitational forces, but if I just did a free body diagram, um, 
So we we'll say this is weightless. There's no gravitational effects. Okay, fine. Um, and then I'll just say, okay, well, what's it touching? Uh, well, the only thing that's touching is actually the string. So we have a tension like this. And does that tension provide a circular motion? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So what we're going to say is that the tension is equal to the centripetal force. Again, we're just saying that the tension is providing that inward force uh, that we're talking about. We don't have any other forces to really deal with because there's no influence of gravity or anything else like that. Uh, nothing is touching, no normal forces or anything else like that. So what's my equation for centripetal force? Mass times velocity squared, or speed squared, uh, divided by the radius. Okay. Uh, so, okay, if I find the centripetal force, then I found the tension. So I just use this equation. So let's see, what have I found? Um, hmm. I don't have the speed. So let's go find the speed first. All right, speed is distance divided by time. We're talking about a circle, so that is same thing as 2 pi r divided by t. Again, by the now we should start kind of memorizing these things. So 2 pi times 1.2 and divided by uh, t. We're, not, we're really talking about capital T now, the period, uh, 1.5. So let's, let's calculate this out, because this won't be something that where pi is left over. 2 times pi times 1.2 divided by 1.5. And I get a speed of 5.027 meters per second. Okay, And that's its speed. Now we're going to take that, uh, plug it into here. And uh, we got a mass, 1.2 kilograms, so, oh, sorry, 0 0.1 kilograms. And we got a speed of 5.027 squared, all right, divided by the radius, which was the 1.2 meter string. So let's find out what this centripetal force is, which is the same as my tension. So 0 0.1 times, uh, whatever my answer was last time, we're going to square that and then divide by 1.2. So I get a tension of 2.11 newtons. Again, that's the same as my centripetal force, which I have here, and that is the same as my tension, because my tension is the net force, and it is a net force that provides me a circular path, so we call that a centripetal force. Okay, let's expand on this concept here. Um, so the question comes up, um, if I go on a circular track in a car, I, I understand a ball and a string, a, you know, string pulls with tension to keep a ball in a circle. Um, I can also understand a satellite going around the Earth, the force of gravity, but what keeps a race car going in a circle around a track? Right, so here's a circular path here. Right, this part is a semicircle. Right, so if I go around this track here, what is keeping it uh, on that track? That's it. There's no string. There's no gravity. There's no black hole in the middle of that thing, or sun, or anything else like that. So I got to figure out what that is. Well, one of the best ways to think about it is um, think about your forces and think about what's going on. What if what if I put a like right here? All right, we'll put a big oil slick right on that track. Put a big oil slick. Right, your car comes along on this path here, and then hits that oil slick. Which direction is it going to go? Oof, right, it's going to go off the track. If I actually look at that, you know, this is like a circular path, and that is a kind of a tangential line right there. All right, so without with that oil slick right there, I just kind of go in a straight line. I, I lose my centripetal force. So what is that really doing? Um, it's taking away static friction. So static friction, right, or friction in general, is what keeps um, um, what keeps uh, race cars on track. So basically the static friction is the centripetal force. Right, which keeps, and we're talking about a uh, unbanked track because we'll talk about that later. So it's a flat a flat road track like this, you know, you're, 
you know, you see the car like that, it's one wheel, it's another wheel, and you get the bumper, so on, so when we're looking at it from the front, right? So static friction is acting, right, to keep the car on the road. Right, without that, with no static friction, the car would just go straight to you, right, and um, you'd go off the road. So at all times, there is an inward force, right, to keep this thing going on a track, and that actually comes from static friction. Because look at this: if static friction disappears, right, centripetal force disappears. You just go off in a circle, just like twirling a ball on a string. Right, everything, everything's lost there, and you just go off in a straight line. So. So using that fact, let's now try to solve a problem of a car going around a curve and uh, see what we can do, okay? Um, so we're talking about forces now. We have multiple forces. The, um, the satellite before just had gravity, um, and I think the, uh, the, yeah, the tension of the ball and the string just had the tension, right? There was no gravitational source. It wasn't a normal force or anything else like that. So now we've got one where we have multiple forces going on. So uh, I'll say that this is like uh, over here is like the center of the track, right? The center of the turn radius. So if like here's the car, then you know this is the center here, and it's going around that. Uh, we know that there's a net, you know, at this point a net centripetal force here, uh, or net force that causes that centripetal force. So, but let's look at the um, let's look at the actual free body diagram to see. Uh, if this is a the road, which is those dotted lines, and we're looking at the car essentially from um, like this point of view right here, like head on, what would we see? Okay, well you'd see that there is a well. Obviously, the car is it's a car. It has it's massive. It has weight, right? Um, okay. Um, we also have the idea that it's in contact with the road, so the road is providing a normal force up um, and so okay now friction is on the road because we know that we have a coefficient of friction um, of one and we got to think about what direction that is uh, this isn't speeding up this isn't slowing down and what, what that friction is actually doing is providing a inward force in this case because that friction without that friction you would just go off in a straight line so this is my static friction. It is an inward force. All right. Now, what is what do I see? I know that my from our last chapter, my normal force here should be equal to my weight. All right. So let's see what is that weight? That weight is uh, 1500 kilograms times 10, so uh, 15,000 newtons. All right. That's my weight. Uh, my normal force is going to be equal to that. 15,000 newtons. Okay, um, so I kind of kind of get that idea. I could have done a summation equation. Uh, okay, then I have static friction. So it's not sliding. I'm going as the maximum speed that I can, so I understand that I'm probably right at the edge of my static friction. Um, so if I'm talking about an edge of static friction, then I use my fun equation. All right, because this tells me what is my maximum amount of static friction that I can uh, that I can hold. Um, so, what is my coefficient of friction? One. And what's my normal force? Fifteen thousand. So, what is friction doing? It is providing fifteen thousand newtons of force inward. Okay, fifteen thousand newtons of force inward. If it was a wet road, then it'd be, you know, some smaller number because that static friction would definitely go down. Okay, so, um, so we're, what are we going to do with this? Alright, so if I look, my normal and my weight cancel out, and so my static friction is my net force. It is a net force that points inward, so that means that my static friction is equal to centripetal. Uh, what's my equation for centripetal? Mass times speed squared divided by the radius. Alright, so what do I know from here? Um, I know my static friction is 15,000. Uh, I know that my mass is 1,500. Uh, speed is what I'm trying to find, that's speed squared. Uh, and then my radius is 
300 meters. Okay, uh, 1500 divided by 300, uh, that's about 5. Okay, I divide that on both sides now, and I get, um, let's see, 3000. Let me take it down here. I get 3000 or so is equal to v squared. All right, so now I do what's it on my speed, and that's square root of 3000. So that is b squared is 54. Oops. Let me move this down. Is 54.8 meters per second. All right? And that is equal to my um, my speed, not my speed squared. All right? So my speed can be 58.4, which means that on, I can go, uh, this roughly, uh, let's say times, let's say roughly 2.2, I can go 120 miles an hour around this turn, right, without any risk of running off the road as long as I have nice conditions, all right? So this means nice conditions is this, right? If it's a wet road, all right, then this number drops, which means this number drops. If that number drops, then this number, and so on, then my critical speed drops. And if it's a slick, you know, slick, an ice patch or something else like that, then this is really going to drop, which means that my critical speed will also really drop. You know, you'll just run off the road, even if you're going 20 miles an hour, okay? So this is actually something that we can see in every, everyday life. Okay, for the last example um, in this section, we'll, we'll get a little bit uh, complex. Um, this is about as complex as we're going to get. If you do calculus-based physics in the future or engineering, they'll probably add another level of friction. Uh, but we're going to be dealing with uh, a no-friction system here. Uh, essentially what we have, uh, if I look over here, I have a car going around a banked curve. Um, whether you know it or not, you actually do this all the time. Um, you know, especially country roads around here, a lot of them are banked around the curves. And you kind of see... A little bit. If you were actually go running on that curve or walk on it, uh, on the uh, you would actually see how much it's banked. Uh, the extreme part is actually uh, race tracks. Uh, Thirty-one degrees happens to be the same uh, banking angle for um, Daytona, right? Daytona 500. So this is an extreme angle of 31 degrees, and you see, you know, the race car go around that that curve um, at this actually, you know, very steep angle right here. Uh, 300 meters also happens to be the radius of the turn, uh, also at Daytona too. The actual 1500 kilograms is just a standard car. I'm not sure if it's actually the NASCAR uh, regulation or not. But um, so what we have now is when we have this bank here, we have a little bit different uh, thing going on. Um, let's look at let's investigate this first. So so let's look at this. We have our uh, object here draw a circle around it and then we have to identify and draw a free body diagram using the forces first one we'll talk about is directly down is weight All right we're kind of a, a kind of on a ramp but we're not going to treat it the same way all right I have weight going down uh, what else do I have it's it's in contact with the surface uh, surface force is basically supporting it but it's always perpendicular so I have a normal force Okay, so I have a weight and a normal force. Now, in our past, we would tilt our heads, right? And we'd look at this. Uh, the other thing is we had no friction, so um, there's no frictional force going on. So what I want to prove to you that even with no friction, you can actually drive around a banked track. So even if there was an icy, icy surface, you know, Teflon on Teflon, whatever it was, um, that you could actually still uh, drive around this track. So what I'm trying to look for is a net force uh, inward. All right, now I'll, I'll draw this with red just temporarily. So I'm trying to find that there is a there has to be a net force inward. All right, some some something that's providing a centripetal force. All right, so um, so let's figure out what that is. All right, well, my weight goes straight down, and and we're not going to tilt. You know, not tilting. In this case, we're not going to tilt our head. 
Uh, the only reason we tilted our head before is just to make it easier, but in this case it doesn't it doesn't help us. Um, so what do I do as a next step? Well, I'll say, okay, i got to break down my forces. So I have, you know, essentially, sorry, uh, let me back up here. My weight straight down. Um, my normal force is off at an angle. And actually my angle that I know is this right here. So this is my 31, oh, that's a horrible, 3, 31 degree angle. All right, uh, which means that I have a normal force horizontal component and a normal force vertical component. Now this is also different because we never broke up normal force before, but that's the reason why is because we was just tilted our head. So essentially, when we do that, you kind of forget that that main force right here, and we'll we'll try to erase that in a little bit. All right, so. Um, if I look at this, what is the force, or what is the net force that's providing that inward centripetal acceleration or centripetal force? And the answer actually is uh, this this y this sorry this x component of your normal force, All right? So this y component just opposes the weight, and this normal force um, inward is actually providing it. And what's really happening here is that this normal force is actually pushing the car inward. It is physically pushing, like without that tilt, without that whatever, there's, you know, if there was no tilt and no friction, guess what? It, it, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't work. But because there is a tilt, and that normal force, or a part of it really, is what's pushing that car inwards. The other part supporting the weight. Alright, so, uh, and let's see, if I look at this from, uh, let's, let's go down here. And I'll say, okay, here's my normal force. So what I got to think about how I'm going to break this up trig-wise. Uh, I'm going to have a you know x component here and a y component here. Uh, that means that my x is equal to. I'm sorry, I forgot my angle. Um, hmm. Actually, to use that same angle, let's let's change this up a little bit. Uh, to use that same angle, I'm going to try to erase some of this and see how much I can do. Uh, so let's try that again. So I say my normal force is off at some angle like this. And I'm going to do, yeah, my y component and my x component. And I know that this angle right here is 31, 31 degrees. All right, that means that my um, n y is equal to my normal times, um, and it, so I'm an adjacent, and so I'm going to use cosine 31, and that means my n x is equal to my normal times sine 31. Okay. Um. All right. So, what do I know? Hmm. I know my weight, right? So that's all about setup and concept here. So I, I know what my weight can be. Uh, my weight is 10 times or 9.8 times 1,500. So it's a 1 15,000 newtons. So if my weight is going down with 15,000 newtons, what's, what's opposing that? Well, it's this Y component right here. So now I know that my Y component is, is also... Um, is also 15,000 newtons. Um, and so what I'm actually going to do, hmm, if I know that my y component down here is equal to 15,000, all right, if I know that my y component is that, and I know my angle, and I really, what I really want to find is what is that x, what is that uh, x component? Uh, I'm not going to actually go find that normal force first. I'm just going to use uh, tangent. How about I use tangent? So if I just said, okay, well, um, I'm going to go up to the top here and say tangent of 31 degrees is equal to my opposite, TOA, um, opposite, which is in X divided by in Y, All right? Which is X is what I'm trying to find, and my Y is 15,000 newtons. All right, now I solve for nx, and that is 15,000 times tangent of 31. 
So that means that my x component is 9,012 newtons. All right, that is my inward component. That is essentially, if I get rid of this right here, all right, that is my inward net force. So what I'm also going to declare that is basically that is what is providing my centripetal force. All right, uh, what do I know about centripetal force? Centripetal force um, is equal to the mass times velocity squared, or speed squared, uh, times the radius. Uh, so that means that my centripetal force is 9,012. Uh, that's equal to the mass, 15, 1,500, sorry. Uh, speed is what I'm trying to find. And my radius was 300. All right, so let's move this some of this stuff around. So I'll say times 300 uh, divided by 1,500. Uh, and then I take a square root. And I get a speed of... 42, uh, say 42 and a half. All right, that's the speed at which I can travel around that bank track, all right, without any kind of slippage, all right, without without um, sliding off or going off, um, you know, some some angle, right. Now that actually happens to be if I multiply about roughly about 2.2. That that's almost 93. 94, 95 miles an hour. So I can go 95 miles an hour around that track without any friction at all, even if it was covered in ice. That's how fast it can go, which is the benefit of the banked curves, right? That's exactly what I can do. Okay, so let's um, let's go on this uh, next slide here, and I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it um, only with symbols, right? And let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. All right, so we're going to be using the same problem, but we're just going to be using it with symbols. Okay, let's repeat this process uh, using only symbols, uh, and then we'll plug in the values at the end. This is something that we need to work on a bit more uh, to find out some more information. So we're going to ignore the numbers until the very end. All right, we'll go through the same process. So the first thing we'll say is what can I calculate? I can calculate my weight. All right, what's my weight? Uh, M G. Fair enough. Okay. Now, if my weight is M G going down, uh, and I see that my normal force in Y is also going as uh, basically accounting for my weight, then I know that upwards uh, that N Y is also whatever this mg is. Okay. Alright, so that also means that this, I, I've driven, drawn the triangle down at the bottom. And I got the angle there, and I get the y component, and so on. Uh, we're actually going to ignore this normal force right here. Uh, it, it's there, right? But we really just want to deal with the x's and y's. Um, so if I don't care about that actual black normal force there, and only care about the x's and y's, then I'm going to say that, okay, I can use tangent. Um, so tangent of the angle is equal to my opposite, which is my x component, divided by my y component, my adjacent. Again, we're using that angle there. Okay, um, so tangent of the angle is equal to, um, let's see, okay, my x component, let's say that's what I don't know, I don't know anything about that, but I can substitute what I know about my y component, which is basically mg. All right, now if I solve for uh, the x component, and x is equal to mg tan theta. Okay, so I just, I did a couple substitutions and I worked it through and just kind of rearranged things. Now, what do we also say that this is the net force, right? Because these two, right, cancel out, and so that's my net force. So that means that my, and it's a for, net force that provides circular motion. So my x component right here is equal to my centripetal force, and that is also equal to mass times v squared over r. All right. 
uh, you know, and this is just by, you know, by name there. So what we're going to say is, what I do know is that my x component is mg tangent theta. Okay. And that is equal to mv squared, or speed squared, uh, divided by r. All right, what I see now is I have mass on both sides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel both of those masses, because I can't. I mean, if I divide by mass on both sides, you know, I just, it would be fine. All right, so um, now let's simplify here. I'm trying to solve for my speed. So that means that it's going to be, okay, get the r on both sides. So I multiply the r on both sides. So g r tan theta is my speed squared. And then essentially square root of g r tan theta is my speed. All right, so now I have a little bit of a shorthand way. If you're a professional, this is the equation that you would use, right? You want to design something, you know, to uh, design a bank, uh, banked curve to withstand a certain speed based off of the road, right? Um, 9.8, which is G right here, does not change. So you had to figure out what angle should I bank the road and then what radius of the turn should I have, right, in order to maintain that speed if you're designing a highway. And this is what you'd use, right, because this is your worst case scenario, an icy situation, an icy whatever. So let's see, if I, if I plug in my values, right, so uh, g is, uh, well, actually we had to use 10 before, so I'll just use 10. Um, g is 10, uh, radius is 300, and the tangent of 31 degrees. And that is equal to the speed. So let's try that all in one go. Square root of... 10 times 300 times tangent, oh, not inverse tan, tangent of 31. And guess what? I get 42 and a half. So either the same or pretty, pretty much the same as we had before. All right. So this is actually something that you can memorize if you would like. All right, we're not we're not road professionals or anything else like that, but you can you can memorize some things like that, or you can just come up with it yourself. Uh, the key thing, though, is what is we what did we have to do? We we um we canceled mass. Nowhere in this equation is mass. Nowhere in this equation is there friction. Right. So if you design this system like this, it doesn't matter if you're in a golf cart. It doesn't matter if you are in a Mack truck. The idea is that mass does not matter. All that matters is um, the radius and the angle at which uh, the, the curve is banked. Which is why when you go down the road and you, um, you come across a sharp turn or something, it, doesn't, it says go 30 miles an hour. It doesn't tell you go 30 miles an hour if you are in a sedan and go 20 miles an hour if you are in a, a truck. It just tells you one speed because guess what? It does not matter on your mass or your size. Okay, so all these things have everyday implications and everyday uh, importance.